Good evening and welcome to the Clark Road Ad um, Barn Advisory Committee meeting. This is meeting number four and it is September 27th. Um, we do have a, uh, an agenda that everybody's, um, I think, picked up at the table. And if you didn't, let us know and we can spend, spend one, send one around. Um, we thought it might be best or easiest to have a presentation for tonight, just to go through the information that um, staff has been gathering um, since our last meeting. And so uh, bear with me for a moment while I pull that up. Looks like Mindy joined on. Oh, she did. Yeah. Okay. Bear with me for a moment. I just need to get to. I don't know why this. Forgive me for a second. I just need to share the screen. And I'm sharing screen one. Hey, Mindy, I, I know you're on right now. I see you're muted, which is lovely. Just want to make sure that you can see what we're seeing that I've, now that I've shared my screen. Yep, I see it. Okay, beautiful. Thanks so much. And you can stay muted and unmute yourself when the time comes for questions. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. All right. Make sure I didn't jump. So the first item on the agenda is to take a look at some case studies. Um, this is information gathered from other places. Not all of them are municipal in nature, but we tried to find as um, examples to just get a sense of um, process, um, you know, a sense of scale, sense of what did other people, lessons that we can learn from others. And um, Matt and I are going to sort of talk interchange interchangeably. Um, he did the lion's share of the information gathering with specific with these case study projects. Um, and so we looked at projects that were either related um, to a historic barn or some kind of a historic structure, relocations and rehabilitations, demolitions, or, um, or surveys um, as well, um, provided context for the cost resources and the time needed. Um, the first one we're going to talk about is, um, and it's not located in Hilton, I just need to say that for the record, it's a Hilton barn, rest of rehabilitation, located in a town in New Scotland. And you'll see that's outside or a suburb south of um, the Albany area. Picture here on the right um, is a picture of the barn being relocated from private property that was subject to um, future redevelopment, and it was being moved across the street, literally across the street, onto, is it newly acquired town land, or they had the land, they just needed to acquire more land? They had the land, um, and yeah, so they were just relocating it onto town-owned property. Okay. So here's a little bit of a timeline, um, and maybe, Matt, you might be able to walk through this a little bit better than I can. Um, if you want to take it off. Yeah. Um, so just some context about the Hilton Barn itself. It was originally built in 1898, and it was recognized as being one of the largest post and beam structures ever constructed. It's 60 feet wide, 120 feet long, and 60 feet high. So putting that in context of it's historically significant and structurally significant. Um, and uh, yeah, so February 2014 is when um, the developer uh, saw that it, it no longer had a use, and uh, the town board uh, mentioned and started an initiative to try and save the barn and um, try and find funding in order to relocate it and find a new use for it. Um, so in 2016, um, Wolf House and Building Movers um, were um, uh, contracted in order to move the barn across the street. The cost of just the move was $121,600. Um, this didn't include any additional mobilization charges. Um, and then, so that was in March of that year. It was, uh, it was set onto the, found, the new foundation in November of later that year. So it was on temporary um, stabilization uh, during that time. Um, in 
2016, later that year, um, the uh, the town had applied uh, through the state in order to get grant funding to rehab the barn, and it was denied. Uh, later, through the same program, uh, the town applied for a Hilton Road Park project, which was for renovations to the barn, but also for development of the park itself, and that was awarded, um, and they ended up getting a $411,620 grant uh, from the state. Um, uh, then they did a renovation on the roof um, through Mid-State Industries of Schenectady. Uh, they were um, awarded the job to install a new slate roof. Um, the cost of replacing the roof was uh, $444,000. Um, um, uh, later on, they, the town saw that the, the damage to the roof was significantly more than they thought, and it went up another uh, six, around $60,000. Um, and so um, they, let's see, what was it? In t December uh, 2022, uh, the town board approved $270,000 uh, uh, out of their uh, ARPA funds to pay for more restoration of the Hilton barn. Um, and so uh, as we go to the next slide, um, yeah, so just looking at an overview of the costs, some of those numbers that I had mentioned, so that 513,000, yeah, 513, um, that was the total cost for place of slate roof after they adjusted, after they knew more about the damage, um, and then the 529,200 for new bathroom siding windows, that was uh, approved this year. Um, uh, that last image on the timeline that we saw on the previous slide shows what the state is today. Um, it's still not a habitable space. I mean, they're still working towards it, but just to give you an idea, they spent over a million dollars over seven years for this um, project, and it's still not quite done. Just giving a context of time for, you know, if we were to rehab the Clark Road barn, it's a long term project uh, based on what we see here from the Hilton barn. Um, and then there was um, mentions to the, the grant funding that they got. Um, but moving on now to the uh, Quaker meeting house. Oh, sorry, a question, Bob. Yeah. Uh, yes, did, uh, for the Hilton barn, did, did they have a uh, end goal use for the barn? It's, yeah, so it's, it's in a park. I assume it's going to have some activity associated with operating a park. Um, it is, uh, let's see, I know that I had a mention of the uses in here. Um, it's going to be a, a multi-use space. It's not just, you know, a recreation space. There's also going to be space for um, restaurant use and things like that. So um, it's going to be a year-round facility that's going to have uh, multiple uses. I mean, part of the proposals for um, the, the park is that they're putting like an ice rink, and so there's a lot of potential for that space to be used for different uses and, you but know, owned and operated by the town. Yes. At this time, you know, um, but um, yeah, so uh, um, that would be similar to one of the alternatives of the town, you know, continuing to rehab it, or if the town were to potentially rehab it ourselves, um, continue to have ownership and then, you know, be able to use it for um, any one of those uses, but um, yeah. Um, and so, yes, moving on to the Quaker Meeting House rehabilitation in Farmington, New York. Um, uh, this is, you know, significantly different from the New Scotland barn, just because it's not a municipally owned barn. Um, this was a barn that, um, in, uh, I mean, it's. Um, in 2006, it was devastated by an ice storm. In that first image, you can see just how, you know, um, what a terrible state it was in. Um, so soon after that, uh, uh, just a public group of citizens got together and put in for a uh, grant in order to um, do some stabilization measures. So in that 2008 image, you can see that they're um, doing some work on it to stabilize the structure. Um, and then in uh, 
2011, uh, they got a, a EPIP loan um, in order to move the barn. Um, EPIP is the, um, uh, can we move to the next slide? Yeah, we'll go to the next slide for a second. second, yeah. Just want to see. So uh, the Endangered Properties Intervention Program, um, which for the, the purchase of the meeting house, um, this was, it's not a grant, it's a loan that they eventually had to pay back in full. Um, we can move back to the last slide though. Um, so yeah, they were relocating it again to just uh, across the street um, onto a historic site. Uh, and then, um, uh, in 2013, um, they got a historic structure report uh, grant from the state of $10,000 in order to, um, from the Preserve New York program, um, in order to do just a structural report of uh, the building. Um, they did when they did the, um, in 2008, when they did that uh, structural um, uh, maintenance on it. They had to remove a portion of the building. Um, so in December 2018, they ended up doing an addition to the building to bring it back to its original um, condition or its original dimensions. Um, and then um, in December 2020, uh, I mean, this is a, also a project where their focus is a lot on preservation of the original structure. So that's why in 2020, they put up this um, metal uh, protection on the side to protect that um, original uh, side shingles that they're there. Um, so again, they're looking to uh, rehabilitate it and use the space, but they're also trying to preserve as many of the original materials, including the siding as they can throughout the entire process. Um, this was located on private property though, correct? Yes. Okay, I just want to make yeah. sure I'm remembering that fact. Um, yeah, so I mean it was um, neglected for many, many years and it was owned privately and then this organization, um, uh, the Quaker Meeting House uh, organization was able to purchase it and now it's owned by this you know, private entity. Um, and then in 2022, uh, the Farmington Quaker Meeting House Museum received a history of equal rights grant of $483,000 um, from the Historic Preservation Fund of the National Park Service to help it restore it to its appearance before the Civil War. Um, so um, it's uh, it's been recognized, it's on the National Register for Historical Places, um, the National Park Service's uh, uh, underground Railroad Network to Freedom, and the National Collaborative of Women's History Sites. So um, while this may be closer and it's, the dimensions are pretty close to the Clark Road Barn, so structurally, you know, it's not as significantly different as the New Scotland Barn, but in terms of that um, historical uh, presence and historical significance, there's a lot of documentation supporting its uh, preservation. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, the costs, I mean, since this isn't a public project, um, it was hard to determine a lot of that. I mean, a lot of the grants that they received were from the state, so I was able to find figures on that. Uh, but like the cost to install uh, that addition or the, um, the protective siding that they have, or they also had issues with um, when they were uh, putting the structure on its foundation, they had to replace a lot of the sills which had rotted. So that I was able to find specific um, costs related to it, but at least from the this study, uh, I was able to look at a lot of the grants that were available, or the loans as well. Um, so yeah, that is the Quaker Meeting House rehab. Look at um, Farm View Market. So uh, this is a case, again, of a, a private entity that wanted to acquire uh, some historic post and beam structures, and so they contacted um, the, uh, let's see, who is it? Um, what was that? Uh, restorations. Um. They uh, they it was um, 
Heritage Restoration. Heritage, yeah, Heritage Restorations. They contracted them to find two unique uh, post and beam structures, and then they had them relocated to uh, Georgia, Madison, Georgia, uh, where those structures were integrated into their new supermarket um, and farmer's market. Um, so the original concept was brought up in 2014, um, and uh, Heritage Restorations found the these two uh, post and beam structures um, in New York State. Uh, they deconstructed them and shipped them down to Madison, Georgia, rebuilt them and um, had them into this um, uh, new, um, very modern uh, looking um, uh, supermarket. And um, the, the there was two barns. There was an English style barn and then a Dutch style barn. Um, but um, yeah, the very unique architectural features, especially in the, the Dutch style barn, which was built somewhere between 750 and 1780. Um, and uh, the organization that initiated the entire product or the entire project was uh, Kelly Products. Um, and they're, they've got 12 different agribusiness uh, entities throughout Georgia. Um, I haven't been able to get too many specifics about the costs associated with it because they're a private entity. Um, but um, yeah, so they had the barn dismantled, shipped, and erected in 2015, and then they opened in 2016. So comparative timeline compared to the other uh, initiatives which have been you know anywhere from like five to seven years from trying to make the barns into fully habitable multi-use spaces this was you know a factor of just a few years from the time that they found the barns to they you know turned them from the just the um, post and beam structures into these uh, into the new supermarket um, moving on to the Briggs Center, um, so this is located at the Harley School. Um, they found, or they were, or I got a lot of this information from um, the Victor Town historian. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, the barn was slated for demolition, but the Victor Planning Board asked the developer to seek bids for salvaging the structure, um, and Harley School um, recognized the, the need. They wanted to create a new space um, for a sustainability center, but the um, the the addition, the Briggs Center serves as uh, many different uses. There's classrooms and, and all that in there. Um, so uh, that was in 2014. They were able to complete the project. Um, but the project, I mean, the, the barn itself, you can see there's a giant addition where it's uh, a greenhouse. Um, it has net zero um, uh, uh, sorry, it's the um, net zero energy consumption. Um, uh, they were you know, really just used the, they were able, really only looking to salvage the frame itself. So this isn't where they picked up the barn and relocated it. Uh, they were just looking at um, salvaging that post and beam construction and used that for um, the core of the building. But then they had um, uh, a lot of different contractors involved in making it uh, a, you know, a uh, very good example of sustainable infrastructure. Um, there's uh, photovoltaic, uh, vol photovoltaic uh, panel mounting, some solar panels on it, um, standing seam, metal roof. Um, and yeah, they have um, a, a good list of all the contractors that were involved in this. So if we were trying to find contractors for um, who were involved in the this renovation, rebuilding of the Briggs Center, um, then that would be an option uh, for us as a resource. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the key takeaways uh, out of these uh, examples is that, I mean, and I think that this is something we knew that barn uh, rehabil rehabilitation is a common practice, but um, there's few examples of what we have here is where we have a municipally owned barn um, and uh, it being renovated or rehabilitated. Um, and the barns chosen for rehabilitation typically have some type of historical or architectural significance. I think the exception was that one with um, the Victor, the Briggs Center, but in that case, they were really just looking to salvage 
uh, that those post and beam structure of the barn uh, and put it into a substantially or um, uh, a very significant building on their campus. Um, and then the, the the timelines for these, it's certainly not just a few years, and especially when we look at the uh, municipality and how long with New Scotland, how long it took them to get the grant funding in place. Um, uh, it's very significant compared to some of the, the private entities that were able to, um, you know, they weren't waiting for grant funding to come through. They just had the funding set in place for it. Um, and then the funding opportunities uh, are never necessarily guaranteed. Um, and that example of the EPIP loan that was used for the um, uh, Quaker, the Quaker meeting. meeting House, um, that program is no longer available. Um, and so um, just kind of taking a look at those, um, yeah, it's, there's not any particular project that I've been able to find in New York State that quite fits exactly what we're trying to do here at the Clark House. I mean, um, another key piece of this is that, you know, the it's not as if um, the Clark House. Uh, Clark Road Barn. Or, sorry, sorry, Clark Road Barn. For anybody yeah. watching at home, I don't want there to be confusion. No, no, no. Um, uh, it's, um, yeah, it's not, um, we're still trying to determine historical significance to it. Um, and so, yeah, that may be um, something, um, I guess, yeah, it, it's all something that was identified as part of these projects that uh, needs to, to, or, you know, could be determined still for um, our barn. Right, so I think looking at these um, examples, we reached out also to um, the heritage restoration just to get an order of magnitude if we could um, from them, we haven't heard back. So part of this effort is trying to reach out to folks, get as much information as we can, understand what other people have gone through. Um, and it's, so this is really the purpose of these um, uh, case studies. And if there are other examples that you all are familiar with that you want us to research, we're happy to do that. We just found the ones that we could find or ones that were mentioned. Um, you know, when we're looking at funding availability, what's available in the private sector or to the private sector is different than what's available to the town or to municipalities. So when it's a privately owned property, there are tax credits available, there may be other incentives available, so that might be what's driving some of the, um, the private sector um, reuse or renovation of these barns. Um, the, Wanted to share with you some of the contractor resources and opportunities. So on the New York State Barn Associate, I'm not saying their name, but the New York State Barn Coalition. Coalition? Yeah, so they have a website and they have um, a list of contractors by county. Um, I contacted all the, the contractors that were available in Monroe County. Um, of the three, Matthews House Movers was the only one who still had a working telephone number. The other two were out of business. I contacted another, I tried contacting, oh, I know I reached out to another contractor, maybe in Wayne County, because I was then picking counties that were nearby, um, and he was upset that his name was still on this website because they have gotten out of the business of barn, they haven't done that in 35 years since the father owned the business or ran the business. Um, but Matthew House Movers is a company that's been in business for 150 years. Um, Peter Matthews, who currently runs the company, is fifth generation. So we asked him if he would be able to come out and take a look at the barn to give some sense of um, the condition. And um, I, Peter, and I, he'll never see this because um, he, I said to him, I said, oh, there's a great 3D model. I can send you a link to it. And he said, are you sitting down? And I said, why? And he's like, I've never opened an email. And we were all a little bit jealous. <laughs> um, so he doesn't use email. Um, so he did come out, and, I'll, and I'm going to talk to him. I'll talk about that in a moment. I'll go through the other contacts and folks that maybe we want to have as available for resources. Um, Wolf House and Building Movers, um, they did the project in New Scotland, that Hilton Barn relocation. So they're another sort of source of information. Um, Heritage Restoration is the one who did the Farm View Market relocation down to Georgia. That's where they disassembled the barn and took the materials down and then reassembled it in the form and fashion to meet their needs. 
Um, and then obviously Genesee Country Village and Museum is another resource in terms of rehabilitation. They've been the recipient of, of barns. Um, it's our understanding that they want no more. Um, so so um, just to share that. And we are continuing to reach out to any other agencies that we think that there could be an opportunity or a partnership or something along those lines that there could be some solution to explore. So we're keeping all options open and we certainly encourage if there's anyone else who's got information, who's seen you know, seen something that might be, you know, lend information to our process. We, Matt and I are not the gatekeepers of all research. Um, so if you have other ideas, and, and we have some folks who have been um, providing information. Oh, oh, thank you. Okay. Oh, this is a barn restoration in Utica. All right, beautiful. He restored a historic building I was involved in. Okay. South of Syracuse. Wonderful. A balloon construction, a two-story house. It was non-traditional by today's standards. Sure. Yeah, I mean, if, if you then um, if you go to Heritage Restorations, they're, it's a private business. I mean, they're doing these beautiful restorations for people to convert their barns into homes. Um, they're, I mean, they're gorgeous, right? I'm just judging by the website alone, doesn't look like it's an inexpensive endeavor to work with them. So, um, but it's good to have that information. Um, oh, I'm, no, I'm jumping ahead. So we did have Mr. Matthews come out and take a look at the barn. I'm gonna pass these down. I'm gonna, I have the email so I can look at it uh, electronically. So, um, and actually, um, Tim is, was at the, the the visit, and but Eric was kind enough to be there with with Tim to let him physically walk the perimeter of the property, and they could he could look inside. He could not access the basement. There's no safe way for him to get under the main floor. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Did. Um, so I'll wait till that goes around so you can sort of see, maybe we can. So this just provides a summary and I'm, I'm happy to upload this. This is as a PDF into the folder for future review and um, consideration. But can I steal yours for a second just so I can speak to it? I'm sorry. Um, so we have, based on his best practice, his, widespread knowledge, just try to put some numbers, planning level numbers, just based on the existing condition, based on the size of the barn, of what what costs might be involved. So estimated cost to pick up the barn and temporarily support it to make repairs to the timber frame and structural supports was estimated at 75,000. Okay. Be, and before we go through these numbers, I'm actually gonna read the paragraph below first, because I think that's important. So all the estimations that were provided are planning level and they're to make the building safe only with no changes to the current layout or visual appearance. Also, this is really important, the estimates reflect the private market pricing and do not include in prevailing wage rates, which the town would be required to pay. Um, so Eric is saying that it, although it's difficult to provide a specific percentage increase to the figures provided by Mr. Matthews, the town should assume the project cost would be approximately 40% higher than what Mr. Matthews estimate, estimates. So I think that's important sort of as a, you know, as a perspective as we're talking through these numbers. Um, estimated cost to repair, pla replace or repair the stone block foundation while the barn is also picked up is some uh, approximately $60,000. Estimated cost to replace the roof is unknown. And so we would have to maybe talk to a roofing company. And we might think about contacting um, the folks who did the New Scotland barn just to get a sense of scale and based on the size of this structure. Um, estimated cost to move the barn to an alternative location. Um, that's a minimum of 75 to 125,000 plus, depending on distance. If it's further than just to a neighboring property, the entire barn would need to be dismantled, labeled, and rebuilt. Um, and one of the things that Mr. Matthews said to me when we were chatting about setting up a time for him to come out, he said, 
nowadays, it used to be utilities would move wires, would do things and change things or like accommodate a large building move and that is not to be expected these days. Um, the um, estimated cost to replace the barn with a replica, he is estimating at one million. And then estimated value of the barn, he said this from the very beginning, it's unknown. The value is subjective depending on the need or the use. That's something that you know, the town has to determine. Um, estimated total cost to make safe, the, the structure safe and usable in its current form and location with no additions of bathrooms or any other facilities, just as a storage structure, esti he's estimating 20, 250 to 400,000. So with a, you know, if we factor in, you know, the, the adjustment for prevailing wage, it could be a, a, a pretty hefty price tag just to have the structure restored in its current location. Um, obviously, picking up and moving it, um, that's a, a, a different conversation. Um, so, you know, we wanted to share this information because we had it and we were happy to have it before this meeting. Um, I'm not sure that we have to do anything with this information tonight. We just wanted to sort of have, oh, I'm sorry. I have a question for, for you or um, Tim. Where the first two estimates have temporary support, was there any clarity in talking with uh, them? What temporary, like how long temporary is? I think uh, what he came up with was it would be safe enough and as long as the roof was fixed, it should hold up fine. So it was, it was like, it would, I'm trying to think the right words for it. Um, Again, everything's temporary. It would be longevity-wise. I don't know. He didn't put a number on that. He didn't put on like, oh, it would be good for like 10 years, 20 years, 50 years after that. But that's a follow-up question we can answer. We can ask yeah. him. He was um, open to follow-up questions. Yep. So so what I heard was two things. You said if the estimated cost for to just repair this stone foundation also assumes that the roof would be repaired for it, the temporary support to actually last? Yeah, I think it would go hand okay. in hand. The, the roof is... Okay, so we can't consider these like as individual bullet menu, points. Menu okay. items, yeah. Some of okay. these have to happen at the same time. Okay, yes. okay. Yeah, and, and I would be just interested how long, like what is the temporary support? And I'm certainly not, uh, might not <laughs> understand it, but but I just want to know like if, if the committee were to, to recommend whatever, temporary support for this, like how much time would that give then for a decision to be made, and depending on what season it is, if the board were to approve a certain action, I mean, does it have to be acted upon like in the fall because it won't last the winter, something like sure. this? Sure, no, that's that's a fair question, and we can certainly ask that follow-up question of Mr. Matthews. He was, um, you know, happy to answer any follow-up questions that might come out of this meeting. So we he knew that we were trying to um, get him in to take a look at it and give his give his best you know, sort of his expertise based on his um, experience. He's currently working on um, restoration and or relocation projects other places in the state right now. Um, so we, we felt fortunate to find somebody so close to home uh, who had this, you know, ability to, um, you know, give some, some expertise where we don't have any. And that's the one thing that we left last meeting saying, okay, we don't really have a, we have to figure out a way to get up some baseline cost ranges, even to know like what the, where we are, what ballpark we're in. Um, and so I feel like this is a, a good starting place for that. And I feel like we just received like a lot of information, a lot of information. In, in half an hour. And so just to like level set, are you expecting like the committee to digest all of this tonight? And then like what what's the... Yeah, so right now there, that's what I'm saying. We don't really have an ask tonight. We wanted just to share this information. If the committee has questions, like the question you just posed, we would give us things to come back with and you know further research. If you had suggestions on other resources we should be checking into, Staff are willing to and happy and willing to to go do an additional study, additional investigation. We're trying to get as much information as we can to this to the committee, so everybody's making informed decisions and making informed recommendations. Like as we get further along 
and we get to the point where we feel like we have enough information to do that, use the scoring matrix on the various alternatives. I think that's ultimately we're trying to, to move toward. Um, the one other thing that somebody asked at one of the last meetings um, was sort of what's the cost to the town right now while we're sort of contemplating future potential plans. Um, and so just so you, uh, the some information, the initial construction of the of the um, construction fence that's around the perimeter of the building, and that is because it is an unsafe structure. And if anybody were to wander in there, and we've had um, people in there, you know, teenagers or whoever, we there's evidence of people being in that space. So uh, the construction f fencing is really a liability and a safety requirement for the town. So the initial and, and just, sorry to interrupt. I, yeah. I did want to make clear that it, it was it was an actual requirement from our insurance carrier and yeah. recommendation oh, oh, by the, that's, atter that's right. the attorney. We had it was either remove the structure at the time or put the fence up, and right. so we, it was that was non negotiable for <laughs> us. And that that six month rental is up. So now we are in the renewal. Period. We're in the renewal phase right now. So every six months, this will be the renewal fee for the construction fencing to remain in place because. Can the folks who rent these out only have a limited supply of construction fencing, and if you're taking theirs and holding it, they need to be paid as if they were being, you know, using it on a different site. Um, the tarp um, that was originally installed that was at a cost of $5,970. Um, back in August, staff um, observed that the tarp was um, failing or coming away in a, an area. I will also mention another, uh, one of the committee members actually yeah. reached out. Town staff had already been aware of it and had already reached out to the contractor. Um, on, and the contractor, um, several phone calls were made, no response. Then email um, has happened, several emails. Um, the last communication that was received by the contractor was, yes, I'll go take a look at it and I'll let you know what the cost would be to repair it. And now um, the director of um, DBW has sent multiple emails and has not received a response. So we're waiting on the information of what it was gonna take, what the timeline and the cost would be to repair the portion of the tarp that is failing. So Do we, are we bound by the same contractor? I, I just don't understand why it's taking so long. Well, I think we're in busy season. So that, that might be one of the contributing factors. This is a high, high, the highest, point of, of construction. So often contractors are onto the next project and trying to get back to a project can be difficult. Um, we can check with the, um, I can check with um, Eric Tate to see if there's another option um, as far as a, a repair. You might also inquire about the uh, useful life of a tarp patch. Yes, yeah, we'll certainly do that. Yeah, thank, thank you, Matt's being kind enough to make notes. Um, yeah, we'll certainly we'll certainly look at that as well. Um, the, the original contractor could be responsible for fixing his own errors too. Right. Well, and it, yeah, yeah, that's presuming if there was if there was some deficiency with installation, there might be a warranty of some sort. We want to make sure that if there's you know a economy of scale, you know, utilizing the same provider, we would want to take advantage of that. Well, that that approach is my opinion, consider a temporary thing. Yes. It's not intended for years of use before they do something. Good, you, correct. Um, I think for now it was a, um, a stop gap at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and then we would, you know, try to figure out if there's a way. Again, we're trying to, um, you know, minimize the cost until we have a, a sense of direction. But if we get some, we can. I think that one of the next steps would be to try to come up with a, again a planning level cost for a roof replacement. Might be a good next step for staff to work on. And so, if there's any um, committee members who've got contacts or potential leads on providers, happy to receive any of that information. Um, I, I think that maybe we're getting just a, a little bit ahead of ourselves. Um, there's one thing that I kind of think that we haven't talked about yet, which is 
um, a historic resources survey of the barn, because we don't really, we still don't know the historical significance of the barn itself, right? Okay. So we don't know whether the barn is historically significant in the terms of historic preservation. That might not matter as to whether or not we save it, we'll see, it kind of depends person to person whether you think that's valuable or not. But if we demolish it, we decide, forget it, we're not doing it, we're gonna demolish it. It still would be a useful, useful information to have. I think it would still be a good record so that we documented the barn and the historic significance, even just within Penfield, the life that it's had, even if it doesn't have a broader scale of significance. So I think looking into a historic survey of the barn itself would maybe be a, a really good next step. I would want to know and, and have to bring that to the town board because right. there's a cost associated with that. Yes, there definitely is. Um, I think it would be kind of difficult to make some of these decisions without it though. And, and it would be a mistake to put a huge amount of money in a roof if you're gonna take the building down. No, 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 and I wasn't suggesting to go, um, I was saying just to have an understanding of planning level costs associated with that. But yes, I th so, and I was uh, hoping to obtain that for free, that, that cost estimate, that planning level cost estimate, just based on yeah. industry standard, not uh, paying anybody to give us that information, if that makes sense. I was trying to figure out what information we can gather for free first before we spend um, any, any, of, um, any additional funding on the property. Um, I think what Shannon is suggesting would also be very useful should we ever, should we decide to keep the barn and to seek grant money, you need to have that done. Okay. I think it would be very helpful if somebody was going to take the barn down and put it somewhere else to know how historically significant that structure is. Sure. Um, you know, okay, so we can, so Shannon, I don't know if you've got yep. contacts for mm -hmm. that kind of a service. I know I, I can think of a couple. Yep, yeah, I can start looking into that. Okay. All right. Um, I'm trying to think of, um, did anybody have any questions? I know we did a lot of talking up here. Um, yeah, just um, in, in Eric's email here, Yep. he, he he mentions whether if the if the barn were to be taken down, the beams could be salvaged and sold. Do we have any idea what their what the value of those beams are, or could we find out what the value is? We can certainly find out. Um, and at one time, I th think it might even have been me that that suggested it at a preservation board meeting. If the beam, if it were to be taken down, could those beams be reused in the building of the lodge? That we would have to coordinate. I can ask Eric to. Uh, determine whether or not that's an option or not. And also to follow on the same email, um, the first estimated cost to pick up the barn and temporarily support to make repairs to the timber frame structural. Do we know what those repairs are? Do we know how extensive the we, repairs are? It, this is sort of assuming some or many repairs are needed. Yeah, I think it was based on the, uh, my guess would be it's based on the visual inspection and the fact that the ma the main floor to the basement is the portion that's failing. The, there's large holes, so there's very few spots you can stand safely or comfortably, and so that might be what the basis was. He, did, he, he stated again, this is like ballpark, right? So it could be more, it could be less for sure. Um, but I think it might be just based on the size of the structure, the beams that would be required to support the the building frame is my guess, um, and then also the you know the uh, the the labor involved with an exercise like that, labor and equipment involved with an exercise like that would be my guess. But I'm happy to clarify that or ask that question, um, and if you don't mind. We're gonna, because I'm. I, I have a couple of questions. We're gonna follow up with uh, Mr. Matthews on. Yeah, I, I guess thinking of the timber frame structure. I'm, I guess I'm thinking vertical and the sills um, rather than the floor, which is in really bad shape. And is right, but there's cross. There's definitely yeah. addition to the sills. I think there might be other cross beam yeah. connections at various yeah, points yeah. And the, th throughout the floor. Yes, there's the cross beam sections that run on the. I think they're very long. I think there's two or three of them that are 
run the whole length. So, and again, just talking to him, it was a total ballpark, like, estimate on what he was just looking at. We went in there, he looked at the, the every beam with a flashlight and just off the top of his head. Did you see the drone footage? He did not because he doesn't have access to email. I would have to bring it to him on a laptop and with him, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I'm not opposed to doing. He's only in, uh, he's not too far away. He's in the area, he's in the Rochester area. Um, happy to follow up with him though and, and get some clarity on some of these questions for sure though. The, the second thing I'd like maybe more information on is uh, I guess the fourth item, uh, the cost to move the barn close, but then if further than just a neighboring property, the entire barn need to be dis dismantled, labeled, and rebuilt. That actually would be a price or an option uh, I would be very interested in learning because a huge question is do we essentially work with the assumption we're staying in the same location or do we make the barn portable to yeah, some I think in the scenarios that we we talked about, I think we had we looked at a couple of those options. So those are each alternatives that could be evaluated um, as to whether or not that's you know preferred, not preferred, you know, on a on a sliding scale. And Michael, I'm happy to. Um, I know that. Um, the, some of the information, all the information is on the drive, but if you want me to s email you final versions of things so you can, I know you've been, um, you've been traveling and I far- work with the virtual versions of the barn over the summer. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah, so I think, um, but we have the, a, a, matri a scoring matrix um, and alternatives that we'll be looking at and I think I'll share that with you so you can take a look and, see, and we can follow up for sure. Um, any other any other clarifications with the information that we've shared? I was curious to the uh, the acquisition costs that someone paid to buy the frame. I think there were two cases there where where the frames one was uh, in Brighton at the school and the other one I guess was in Georgia. Yes. I'm yeah. Just wondering what what, what they paid for that privilege of getting. Yeah, you know what? That's a great question. Um, again, because those were private. Um, you know, that's it was a private sale and a private build. I, that's I'm happy to. Uh, I'll ask the question. I, I'm not shy. How much did I, how much does that cost you? And and we'll see if we can get more information. Um, Heritage. The one I was hoping to reach out or hear back from Heritage Rest Restoration because they were the purveyor of that transaction. So they would have the information on how much it cost them to buy it, how much it cost them to transport it, and you know. Uh, I would just indicate them like we're not trying to, we're not feeding this information. Often private entities or companies don't want to share their costs because that could be detrimental for competition to know that information. I will, I can't swear myself to secrecy because I'm going to say it on a microphone, <laughs> but I'll see if I can get some information on, on that. Yeah, to that to that point, I've heard of a, a sealed bid as well. If, if that opportunity arose, people can actually uh, put a bid in. You know, sure. So you multiple opportunities. Right, and that's certainly something we can talk about or look into as a group um, as the process proceeds. Um, I think that you know the town board obviously convened this committee to to gather ideas and to get uh, you know a sense of direction and a recommendation on how to move forward. And so we can certainly we shouldn't be leaving anything off the table at this point. Any, anything else? I wanna make sure I'm not, oh, I think, let me make sure I'm, oh, so we'll, we'll this is one thing we'll talk about um, before we depart. So there's limited external funding opportunities for projects of this nature. Um, New York State Consolidated Funding application is probably the only potential public funding available to us right now, and it would be through the Environmental Protection Fund Parks Preservation and Heritage Grants. So that's how some of the projects that we talked about got partial funding. Um, the New York State Historic Barn Rehabilitation Tax Credit is lovely, except it's not available to us as a town. We don't pay um, property, we don't pay tax on the property, but again, if, if the, you know, that if somebody were to acquire the structure, could they be eligible for tax credits for reuse of a, so these are the kinds of things we wanna understand but we can't take advantage of that of that uh, 
of that tax credit. If anybody is aware of or familiar with any other funding opportunities, again, we are not pretending to be the experts. We're only the people with the PowerPoint, <laughs> like so. So if there's, if you come across anything, you read an article, you see something interesting, and we'll do the digging to see if there's anything else that we've missed. Unfortunately, some of the past um, funding uh, opportunities have since gone away. So other projects 10, 15, 20 years ago benefited from uh, additional funding streams that we no longer have access to. There, there have been projects where the disassembling of a barn is more expensive than the demolition of the barn. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, it's, uh, it's certainly partly because of the labor in involved it's you know cheaper for machines to uh, for bulldozers and uh, buckets to swing at a, a structure versus and that goes right back to whether or not the building the style of the building is historically significant and that the connections are worthy of saving sure yeah no these are all good points and i think um well, you, I, what we're trying to do is we're, we can answer some, uh, some of the questions you've raised. I think what would be best would be to get those clarifications and then send an email out to the group with the information. I think to the extent that we want to explore some of the information, we might need more time to gather and then discuss with you at our next meeting, um, which we're looking at potential dates in October and November based on the availability of this room and the availability of PCTV. I think we might be looking at November just because of PCTV's availability. Um, they are very busy and they are um, currently a little bit understaffed um, or down a person. So if we don't have anything else, Oh, no, I just, I'm sorry. I actually just have one question for Shannon. That survey, um, can you share more about the process and how long that would take? And is that something that the committee can run in tandem, assuming it's approved by the board? Yeah, so um, a historic resources survey basically would involve a lot of research, um, gathering information on the background of possibly when it was built, who built it, what the purpose was, um, the, if the construction style is significant. So just a really in-depth research analysis of it. And then basically going from there, taking that information and then someone in the historic preservation field saying, is it significant based on what they found? And then saying, what are the historical features? Um, and it, you know, not, they don't say straight out, does it deserve to be saved? But they kind of would give you, um, some information on how significant it is mm -hmm. and how rare it is maybe because that was something that we talked about too but kind of don't have a definitive answer on is is this a one of a kind i don't think so but right. we don't know for sure um so it just give us more information and more background that can just be a great record as well as a great reference so how long does that take? What's the, the standard costs? I, and can it be run tandem with the committee's other work? Yeah, I think it can definitely be run tandem. Um, it kind of would depend on who we have do it. Um, I know Barrow Architecture does them. Um, the Landmark Society would definitely have some resources for us um, on who to contact, um, who, they perf who they recommend working with, because it's not someone you just want to hire anybody for. You do want someone who, um, you know, has experience doing it and will do a good job with it. Um, so it kind of depends on their availability, I think. As far as the cost, I don't think it's anything extreme. I don't have a ballpark, yes. so I know I'm sorry. And, then, and so that research <laughs> process, how long does that take? Is that something they can complete in three to four weeks? Are we talking three to four months? I think it's probably a few months. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'd be curious because I, yeah. so I think it depends on the level. So I think maybe it, it depends on the company. I think there's different levels of historic research surveys. Okay. So I think it depends, you know, we could do a baseline one more in depth. I think it depends on how much time they have and how much, if one person is dedicating all of their time to this one project, it probably wouldn't take them that long. I have done them before, um, and it, depending on the project, it takes at minimum, I would say, a month. 
And does that include like a lot of site visits where they would need to get into the basement to actually put eyes on stuff or Prob is it all like paper trail? Yeah, they'd probably want to take a look at the site, but I think, you know, the, um, the 3D model and everything should serve them better than actually visiting. Okay. Everything else they can do outside, but a lot of it is going to be just in-depth research. So I guess maybe, you know, um, when you're making the recommendation to the, the board carrier, folks can think about the extent, to the extent of how, what, what you want, right? Right, right. And, I think what might be really helpful needed. is to get some uh, sense of a cost estimate and a scope of service from a couple of providers. I'm familiar with a few um, in the field to see what, what we're talking about so we have some frame of reference. Is there a number that people would be like, oh my gosh, we shouldn't spend more than X number of dollars on that historic that historical significance survey or you know historical assessment? Yeah, and I do think you know, obviously it does depend on the cost, but I think no matter what direction we go with this project, I think it's a great resource to have to make decisions, and also is for record keeping because we don't have much information on it as of right now. And I don't think we have an inventory of the, the damage that was done to the details of the structure when the farmer made repairs and put in intermediate supports and put scab steel panels on it and put rod stringers between the Silk right. plates to uh, keep the building from changing shape. Right. Well, we also know that because Dolomite owned it before we did, and they have a nice um, supply of uh, rock and <laughs> cement that they've done their own repairs to the building to shore up sections of it because we have original stone foundation, and then we have portions that are newer, newly poured or newer poured concre uh, concrete. Well, and, and when that block, I, I believe that when that building was built, it was intended to have cows in the bottom and hay in the mow, and with the hay in the mow and the cows in the bottom, the building didn't freeze. Right. Now you empty out the hay and take the cows out, that stone wall foundation is subject to freezing and thawing and that they come apart readily. Right. Right. I was just thinking with the study, um, there might be some return on investment, because I think it was mentioned before too, if it is historically significant, obviously it's gonna change and it's great information for our group for decision-wise, but if the decision was to sell it, does it make it more attractive? Does it does it jump the price up based on, so there may be, maybe we spend, and I don't wanna even throw a dollar amount out for yeah, what the pretend. word extreme means to some people for, for dollars. Uh, I'm sure for me it's like five bucks. But um, you know, I look at something like that as, it's definitely worth it if the decision is to maybe sell it, but it may, may be more attractive for that silent bidding sort of a thing to say it is historic and it does have that, so I think, you know, it is worth getting that based on the timeline and costs as it may persuade those sort of decisions, um, but also make it more attractive because we do see from the research that Matt did that, you know, it's a, more of a private type of a thing to own it and to rehab it and to do that where you don't see municipalities owning it and then going from there. So. As much, yeah. yeah. When you look at Heritage Restoration's right. website, it, it appears- the reason why that doesn't happen. Right. Um, I, all right, so we'll do a little research on our end, see if we can get some uh, cost estimates. Um, if I, I don't want to, I don't want to delay the processing of that too much. If if that if the committee is comfortable moving in that direction, and we're able to obtain information to present to the town board, we can always do that without having to have this yeah. committee committee meet again. Correct. Am I, is that a fair? Is everyone comfortable at least moving in that direction? You could sounds tell like the town board that we support yeah. that. I'm sorry. It sounds like a very important step to do, so I think yes, I mean. Okay, all right, that's fair. Because the, the board would review the costs and see if they think it's worthwhile. Yeah, because yeah. I'm just thinking where we are in the year also. Um, there's yeah. only, I think, just a, a handful of now legislative meetings. Sessions. So, yeah, yeah, so in order to um, put a resolution to authorize the spend and get this started, right. I, th I think, you know, right, like October, November, and then 
uh, December is, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the Wednesdays fall with holidays. So Right. Um, so we can try to do our best to get some cost estimates associated with doing a, um, an assessment of the site from a historic perspective, and then um, we'll be able to, as soon as possible, bring that to the town board at a work session, and then d review it, decide whether or not you want to go forward with resolution, if that's yeah. was, that's warranted. Well, I, I'm thinking so long as the committee is okay moving, again, I didn't hear like extent scope of, scope of work. I'm thinking speed is probably the, the most important factor here, so you have that in tandem as you're making your decision. So if we're not looking at, you know, Right. For a thesis on this thing that's going to take four months to mm -hmm. to put together, then the scope of work is going to be a little bit more defined or narrow. Right. And then so let's get that up and running so you guys have it as part of your consideration. So right. if you circulate just maybe two options for the committee and then if everyone's comfortable responding by email, we can get it at the next work session and then get it on the first ledge. Okay. Cool. Wonderful. <coughs> I can help you with that, Carrie. Thank, I was, I'm glad you volunteered because I was going to volunteer you. I figured. <laughs> Don't worry. I was tagging you in this one anyway, I whether you raised your hand or not. <laughs> Ask Matt how that goes. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But I'm not, though. I'm sorry. I was definitely asking you. Um, all right. Well, that's really all we, I mean, that's a lot of information. Um, we'll upload everything. We'll share it in the, in the drive. If anybody has like technical difficulties accessing files on the drive, please let me know that. I know that um, gets a little bit tricky with permissions and all that good stuff. So if there's anything you need, happy to also just send it as email attachments if that's easier. Most of these documents now are not too huge, so it's not a not a problem. Could you resend the link to the Google? I certainly article? can. Thank you. Yes, I'm I can. sure it's lost in my email. Yeah, yeah. Thank happy you. to resend. <laughs> I'll resend that around to everyone. All right. So if if we don't have anything else to chat about, discuss, I'm looking around. All right, um, so then I'll just call this meeting adjourned at not quite 7.15. I should just look at my computer. Um, and if, um, 6.34. Oh, 6.34. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I should look at my phone. I don't have my contacts in in case oh, okay. that wasn't, and there's a glare up there, so I'm seeing oh, okay. a new time. 6.34, thank you, everybody. Now I just embarrassed myself on TV. Um, everybody have a good night, and um, we'll post when the next meeting is going to be. But we're, I think we're anticipating sometime in November, just based on availability. All right. Thanks, everybody.